I'd like to welcome everyone to our September work session. It today is September 13th at 4 p.m. If you would, please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There is an agenda in front of us. Is there any recommended changes to this agenda? No recommended changes. Is there a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland, second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor? All right. Yes. All right. The first item on our agenda for today is the Forsyth County Schools Education Foundation with Jennifer, Evan, and Michael. Welcome. Good afternoon. How's everybody? <laughs> exactly. You ready? We're excited to be here. So we uh, do look forward to giving you guys an update, mainly because in, in the event you're in need of any good news, we have nothing but good news in our presentation for you. So yep. uh, Michael and I, you got it. You got it. Well, um, you know, first of all, I'm Evan Profeta. I'm uh, now the past chairman of the Forsyth County Education Foundation. And thank you. Gotcha. Joined by Michael Barron, our current chair. Michael's going to share a little bit more about himself here in a few minutes. But we also have uh, some of our board members here with us, Fonda Harris, Doug Dershmer, uh, along with us. And we may have some others join us uh, here in a moment. But uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you especially to our board members who work very hard to help us accomplish our goals. And thanks to all of you as well. As we're going to touch on here in a moment, um, without everyone's uh, support and participation, we would not have been able to accomplish the goals uh, that we have uh, in the past and of certainly the ones that are in front of us. We're without one of our hardest working members today, okay? You guys know this already. She's out doing more hard work somewhere else, but we would not be anything without Hannah. So yep. uh, we, we definitely want to go on the record and please extend our thanks to Hannah and her hard work. Um, and we can't take any credit for this deck either, right? That Again, talking right. about Hannah. That's right. She's the power behind all she, this. She serves it up to us yep. uh, and, uh, She's and, amazing. and does works works on both sides of the house uh, for for all of our efforts. So um, 2021, we saw four of our board members roll off at the end of 2021. Uh, we added two new members and we re-welcomed a few that wanted to stay with us as well. So we're really happy and proud to have them want to continue to serve along with us. Um, our work in 22, of course, consisted of the duck dive for education. If you don't know what the duck dive is yet, maybe you're living under a rock, but it, it is one of our missions to make sure everybody knows uh, what the duck dive is about. And you're, you're seeing the duck in a couple of different forms right now, so we're going to talk about that as well. But um, we're very excited. We'll come back to, to Fry in a minute, which we just had a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, and thanks for all, the, awesome. all of you participating that we're able to get out. And I'm sure you saw the joy not only on the teachers and staff that we were presenting these checks and grants to them, but at the end of the day, obviously, the students that we don't get to see, but they are presenting them to them. I'm sure it's just a joy. So That's thanks right. for y'all's participation in that, for sure. It's a highlight for us to see to see that money uh, go to work and how, how much it's appreciated, for sure. Uh, the foundation is growing. Uh, we're growing in responsibility uh, tremendously, especially with the various uh, scholarships you see uh, on the slide here. Tim, uh, Tammy Waddell Memorial Scholarship, Wayne Jones and Dr. Layla Denmark uh, Scholarship as well, which is all of those programs are evolving. We simply oversee uh, things as it relates to the financial aspects of those things, but uh, we are continuing to be looked, uh, looked to uh, for those kinds of responsibilities, which we welcome. Uh, it, it helps us expand our footprint, expand the awareness of the foundation, mm -hmm. and, uh, and helps us grow the organization. So. Um, other initiatives that we have, the, the Families in Need, uh, relating to Dining with Dignity, uh, that was started back in 2019. And now Staff Scholarships, which is a really uh, neat addition, something that Wes brought to our attention as a need, and we were able to make that fit very well with the uh, newly renamed Dr. Jim and Peggy Morrow I Challenge. So, of course, that continues their legacy and the hard work that they were doing to raise money uh, for technology. And now, with the flexibility we have to... Uh, allocate that funding uh, a little differently, we're, we get to meet uh, an even greater need uh, with that as well. So that is very exciting for us. All right, so back to the duck dive and the, and the 2022 uh, school grants. Um, we had another successful fundraiser, no doubt. 
Uh, all of the schools participated by having the duck visit and recording a video with the duck and the principal at each school sharing their information with the families. I think that's really, you know, that media push that, again, Hannah is, is right at the heart of and her team as well. Uh, don't don't want to leave them out because the kinds of work that they are doing to, uh, to give us that social media presence and, and to really uh, help us have a huge impact uh, is tremendous. So 7,000. Uh, 876 ducks were adopted, which broke our record from, from the previous year. Uh, Michael's going to share a little bit more about the goals for, for this year, and we raised $124,606, which, you know, for fundraising, especially uh, during, during the time at which our fundraiser was going on, is really, really tremendous. So uh, we held the duck dive, which, of course, is every April. It's that Friday right before spring break. Another great fun event that if you haven't had a chance to come out and attend that, that one is a, a lot of fun and uh, you know again we thank everybody for their uh, participation so better beer and you love that event too don't you you, you get to pick out the winner and you get to bring the love to that it's great thank you we have yet to get you in the pool <laughs> <laughs> haven't, haven't get you in the pool yet yeah, so it's too cold all right so uh 41 grant uh, application submitted for 2022 all of course aligned to the learner profile um some really excellent requests. We were excited to be able to fund 30 of those grants for all 126, just over the money raised. Our promise always as it relates to the duck dive is that every dollar that we raise, except for the prize money, we have the prize money that goes uh, out of those funds, but every dollar goes to work in the schools uh, for the teachers' ideas uh, to benefit the kids. So we, we were able to impact 33,000 students and uh, our presentation which will be available has a list of the grants with descriptions and, and things like that. So since 2016, just short of $500,000, $481,000 in grants, impacting 108,000 students, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and of course, that culminates with, with FRIA. And so all of, many of you, I think everybody, we didn't get to see everybody because we, we had to do three teams uh, to cover the county effectively and, and to keep things mystery enough for, for all the schools receiving grants. But it is uh, really a highlight for everybody to, to be a part of. And, and to award those grants. There's a lot of anticipation uh, and surprise and appreciation that goes along with that. So as I mentioned, we have student scholarships, uh, the, the two scholarships we mentioned, and new for 2023. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael next. If you haven't met Michael yet, Michael, like myself, is an alumnus of uh, Forsyth County Schools. Both of us went to South. Yep. And, um, and so Michael is taking over as, as the chairman moving forward. And I'll leave it to you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I know I've met a lot of you here, but uh, but again, you know, I appreciate it, Evan, obviously with your, your leadership and along with, you know, obviously Fonda and Doug and, and every other that have been, you know, in the past since 2016 have just really paved our way to the future. And I'll tell you, it's just a complete honor to even be in the consideration for the chair. And I appreciate, you know, obviously the team and Dr. Beard and the team to, you know, put that in my hands. And I we're excited, not only my hands, but the team. So thank you. So we, have, we you're talking about um, just exciting from, we'll, we'll go ahead right into, what we have coming up, um, just just from a standpoint of all the things that I think we have in front of us, the future, right? We talked about the 481,000 that we've, we've we've grown from since 2016. You know, we have in grasp in our grasp a million dollars. You know, in the next you know three five years, easily be able to reach our one of our main goals. We saw the 780 76 you know ducks that we sold. If we can get to 10,000, you know that's going to you know be able to provide a hundred thousand dollars just in that aspect. And with all the community leaders, you know, like yourselves, and obviously the people that are you know the businesses in our community that are able to provide a lot of these sponsorships. If we continue to do that and get really well with that and get a lot of bit more broader in the community, we really have a tremendous aspect and really tremendous growth ahead of us. So that's a tremendous, obviously very exciting for us, you know, to be able to grow really, really good in the, in the community. I'm glad you mentioned, if I can add, add along with that, I, I failed to mention, really point out our sponsors. We had, please take a look at the sponsorship list and you'll get an idea of the mm -hmm. businesses that are, that are in the boat with us here, okay? Um, we have a lot of repeat sponsors, number one, which shows their commitment to our schools. And then our title sponsors, Automation Direct and Ricky, and, uh, Ricky Bryan Properties, yeah. uh, really tremendous uh, participation from them. They, they live and breathe this. They, they, they mean it from the heart. If you didn't have an opportunity to hear them speak at the duck dive, you'll really hear their motivation for, for being a part of this. And, uh, and, and that, that puts gas in our tank to, 
to, to keep things going as well. So thank you. Yep. Yeah, no, it's tremendous. They've been a part of this, this foundation since day one. So obviously thanks to them. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, 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 the Lila Denmark Memorial Scholarship. You want to just dive into that just real fast? You know, the, sure. the ins I mean, and outs. That, is everybody a, familiar with the Denmark yeah, family and yeah. the, the history there? Right. So that, that's something that's evolving. Jennifer, that behind, behind closed doors. Somewhere. That's yeah. all right. So she's, she's working back there. But, uh, <laughs> so it, it is evolving a little bit in terms of the ideas, uh, you know, to, to fund uh, that, that scholarship um, and, uh, and what, that, what we'll be able to do. Uh, but essentially there are some bricks that have been recovered from the original building uh, at, at the property. And so those, uh, you know, the first 310 participants are going to receive a brick uh, from the Hansard Dr. Denmark office, the Hansard House. And uh, along with the commemorative plaque, and so those funds are going to go directly to the scholarship. And uh, I know there's some other ideas too on how to how to grow that uh, idea further. Yeah, thanks, Evan. So the next thing we want to talk about is the I Challenge. Just as Evan mentioned a little bit earlier, I mean the I Challenge brings a really good aspect to the community. It brings community together through fitness, right? And there's just a you know obviously competitive you know aspect to it as well. And there's 28 days that really um, bring obviously the community together for you know being able to get health and fitness, and that's one of the key you know learner profiles as well. So it really does a really good job with our title sponsor, you know, Ch you know Children's Healthcare for Scythe. Uh, all these funds will be raised to as we talked about earlier, the teachers, uh, the paraprofessionals so that they can move into teacher assistance and or, you know, move into other aspects like teacher counselors. So it gives them a great opportunity through the iChallenge to be able to provide those particular grants and, and to, to get them to move on if that's something that they, they, they want to do um, with those certif certifications and such. That's right. And Wes, maybe you, you can speak to that for just a moment, uh, just about what, mm -hmm. what that really means in terms of uh, helping teachers go through the program too. Yeah, I think one of the things that Forsyth County has always done is looked at the needs and what they have and then try to find the best avenues to fill those needs. And I think that over the last couple of years, maybe several years ago, you guys partnered with Valdosta State uh, to grow the counselor program. And we're in the same situation now where we need more counselors. Well, for our certifications, for teacher certifications and for the counselor certification, this takes a personal commitment financially to get that um, through Kennesaw, or through Valdosta State. And so one of the things that the board and I were looking at is how are some ways we can help with that tuition? Mm -hmm. And I had the conversation with Evan, and I'm so excited you guys took this on yep. because it is a financial um, commitment to them. And so by having a... Uh, an avenue to help with that just a little bit um, yep. will really go far. And so um, I know that Dr. Bearden's already signed up for the I Challenge. I know the McCalls are signed up for the I Challenge. I hope the other board members will join us for 28 days of um, fun and working out. Uh, the last <laughs> challenge I did was the uh, um, the Warrior Dash in 2018. So I'm looking forward. Oh, you're a little this. behind, Wes. I know. Gonna... <laughs> so I'm at, this 28 days is going to be you sure. Fun. 28 we're, days. Yeah, it's 28 days, and so yeah, um, sign up for it. But you know, it goes to the the right needs and cause. And so thank yeah. you so much for stepping up doing that. And uh, we're going to challenge our other fellow commissioners and state Please. legislators, and we're going to try to get them on board because this helps our teachers and it helps them um, with their professional development and return helps our community. Yep. Thank you. No, for sure. Yeah, little, for a good cause and a little competitive, you know, spirit yeah, too, right. too, always makes it fun. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, very, you know, $10 for students and $20 for adults. So we look forward to, and if there's any way that you guys can obviously spread the, we know the networks and, and are, you know, large. I know you're very, you know, LinkedIn, I know that you do a lot of there, too. So if there's any way that we could spread the, the I Challenge out in the community, we really appreciate it. That's so right. For participation, of course, and there's a lot of opportunities and room for mm -hmm. sponsors still. So Yep, uh, absolutely. Celebrate at the end of Halloween with some chocolate. That's it. October 31st. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need it. Good tip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you want, you want to talk about the Dining for Dignity a little bit, Evan? Um, this, is, this is not a program I have as much familiarity with, yeah. but, uh, of course, this is uh, over the COVID time frame, uh, and Tim can speak to this as well. Uh, but, you know, there was meals were being covered by the USDA, and so uh, now that that has ended, uh, this program has an opportunity to get started again uh, where, you know, we're able to help fund uh, meals for that purpose as well. So, Yep. And then so just talk, going back to the Denmark, that launches November 7th. So exciting time there. Some other, you know, obviously grant, you know, appreciation there. Duck Dive will be February 22nd. And then we'll also be the drawing, like I said, right before our uh, spring break vacation. So um, all in all, 
Um, all the help we can get from just, you know, spreading the word from the duck dive to the eye challenge, just the foundation in general. Um, we appreciate all the support, obviously, from the local community sponsors, uh, the teachers, staff, and of course, the, you know, the Board of Education. We couldn't do it without you. And of course, Miss Hannah Samples, right? So, um, and Jen, of course, always a big part of that. So we appreciate it. Um, we're, we're excited about where this, the future of this foundation is, is heading. Um, and it's through all the hard work of, you know, all the, all the other board members that some of them aren't here today, but, um, but we're excited about it. And, you know, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. And I just want to say going back to 2015, when this all started, I mean, this has exceeded all expectations in terms of where we thought this would go. And I think that the best is yet to come. I, I really think this is take, taking root in our community. You're right. I think everybody knows about the duck. Uh, the kids certainly know about when the That's duck right. is around. Yeah, and so uh, I, I'm just so appreciative of, of, of all of you who are part of this foundation giving up. They don't get one penny for it. They all do this out of the goodness of their heart, giving back to their community. And we have tremendous leaders as part of our governing board and just just thank you from the bottom of our heart for supporting our, our kids and our staff. It's, it's greatly appreciated. We love being a part of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we love thank being you. a part of it. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I wanted to add to that. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone involved. Um, and then when it came to Friday, I, I didn't participate in the past or last year. Um, I don't know what I was doing. But um, this year, you know, we were on the team, and yep. it was awesome. Um, and I think what I, my takeaway from it was – you know, the teachers were so excited when they got their grant funded. And I'm like, no, thank you, because yeah. they're the ones who invested their time and really took it to heart. Like, oh, I want to do this for my kids. I want to mm -hmm. do this for the students. And so, um, you know, I've done fundraising in the past with different organizations. And it's just awesome that the Education Foundation, that you guys are excited, um, you know, that it is so popular it's such a positive thing um and typically you don't really hear that a lot when it comes to fundraising sure. it's like oh i gotta do this oh i gotta and i think it's just a testament to our strong teachers um and their support of the students because it really is that direct local you know teacher who comes up with the grant that they want or the team you know complete the grant and then submit it um so. Quick, quick story for you guys. One, one of the grants went to Liberty Middle School for 5000 and I don't know if you remember the grant, but it was for this room that they were outfitting to uh, help students who are dealing with counseling-type issues and you know, students may be in crisis or whatever, a real safe, comfortable space. Um, they received that $5,000 grant. They had it spent the following week, and I was at Liberty <laughs> today. The room is completely outfitted, and it is absolutely beautiful. It is a great space for kids, so that was just incredibly heartwarming. So, again. Yeah, this is a cool. big deal. I know it's come a long way, and I know you guys know the work behind the wheels that turn this, and Hannah helps out a bunch. We yep. agree. But, you know, I remember back in the day when, even Paula was superintendent, and her and Ann were having conversations about the foundation and what they'd really like to. They had visions at the time. And now to see it as a reality and seeing where it's going, I'm sure Paula's told stories because we have other yeah. storytellers on our board. Um, but it was interesting to see how far we've come with it. And I think y'all get the fact when I say it takes a long time to get there. I mean, I've been on the board 18 years. It seems like yesterday when we started a few of the initiatives this being one of them, and, and seeing where it is today is just amazing. So I look forward to the future. Yes, sir. As you said. Look forward to it. Thanks, thanks for starting that. We're, we're very fortunate to have Paula and Fonda as well. All, no of, all of the members. On, but we're civilians. We don't speak education. So without, exactly. without, I feel their, that. Help, right. yeah. uh, without yeah. their help, we, we wouldn't be able to decipher some of, some of the things. Fonda speaks it fluently. Yes. 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 We're we're side by side. I'm sure she's not up here, actually. She yeah. needs to be yeah, side by side, making sure we're saying the up here. correct <laughs> things. <laughs> But thank, thank you, you guys. Very much. Thank, thank you, you board. Very much. Twenty-eight day challenge. Who's with? Yeah, us? sign up. You can play twenty uh, tennis for twenty-eight days. Thank you. Is that, that part of it? It is. Yeah, yeah, I do that. that. Oh, well, we'll, we'll make an exception for you. I'm in. Yeah, all right, perfect. All right. So the next item on the agenda is student assessment update with Miss Leanne Rice and her team. Do you mind introducing your team to us? Please? I would love to introduce my team. They are absolutely amazing. So I have Amy Chang, who is our federal programs director, uh, Heather Gordy, who's our director of secondary ed, Tim Kieser is our accountability coordinator, um, Susan Norse is our <laughs> assessment coordinator, uh, and Amy Bartlett is our director of elementary education. 
I needed one more cup of coffee before I came down, I think. <laughs> So we're very excited to get to present to you um, a result of our assessments from last spring, specifically the Georgia milestones. The last few years, we've been a little inconsistent because of COVID, and we haven't had a full implementation of the Georgia milestones assessment system until this past spring. And so we want to share with you where we are on that um, and give you some further information about our next steps. As we come together, just wanted to remind you of two of your governance goals that this appeals to is our goal two that ties everything we do to the learner profile and also goal three, uh, our effective and official financial planning because you're going to see what we did with some funding based on our scores. Um, and then I also wanted to tie it to our new strategic plan. We have a goal area specifically um, focused on the learner experience. And what we're going to share with you today is talking about the things that we're strategically doing to increase student achievement, increase student growth, and increase student engagement. So what we're going to do today is a little different than what we've done with you in the past. In the past, we've really gone deep into the data, um, looking specifically at all everything that we could do data-wise. Data tells a story, but it tells part of the story. And so we also want to take, once Tim shares those results with you, we want to take you a step further. Uh, the past several years, we have received federal funding um, related to the CARES Act and specifically looking at how are we addressing learning loss. So I've asked Amy Chang to share with you some further information about that so you can see those intentional things we've done to address our students who may have experienced some of those learning gaps. In addition, we've used some of that federal funding to look at summer learning opportunities. And so I've asked Heather Gordy and Amy Bartlett to share with you, they oversaw our summer learning programs from kindergarten up through our seniors in high school. And so they're going to talk a little bit about how we structured that and the results that we saw from those summer learning opportunities. But we don't stop when summer ends. As we're running into this school year, we want to make sure our students are prepared and that any of the learning challenges we still have, that our teachers are equipped to address those. And so Susan Norris is going to share with you some information about what's called the Beacon Formative Assessment. This is a tool that is provided free to us from the Georgia Department of Education that helps teachers gauge where their students are based on the Georgia Standards of Excellence and helps them determine how they can inform their instruction to meet the needs of their students where they are. And then I'm going to close you out with where Mitch and I are in leading our schools with the development of their school improvement plans and how all of this ties together. So Tim, will you start us out and talk about milestones? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, this first slide, uh, this basically is just an overview of the Georgia milestones. So we have the end of grade assessments and the end of course assessments. So what you see here is what is tested at each grade level. And then a statement that basically describes the purpose of the milestones. Um, one thing to consider that's different from years past, um, beginning last year, we've only got four end of course assessments. This used to be eight, uh, with physical science being primarily tested in Forsyth County at the eighth grade level. So four of those assessments were removed, so we're down to one per uh, subject area with end of course. And since we still teach physical science in eighth grade, uh, we still give that assessment, even though it's no longer in EOC. And I'll address that later as well. So end of grade. So this view, uh, this is what you recognize from the past uh, that, that we've shown you. This is each grade level, each subject that is tested. And so you can see here uh, grades three through five, uh, individual grade levels, how um, our students perform consistently higher than the state average. Is this from the past one? Yes, ma'am. And this is the combination of grades three through five. So this view gives you um, across elementary school, how are we doing compared to state counterparts? And of course, grades six through eight. So this is the same thing with uh, individual grade level assessments. And the one that might stand out to you over there is that eighth grade physical science. Uh, and on this one, you'll see that our score is, uh, our proficiency level, is very similar to the state average. And I've got a statement down there at the bottom of the slide that shows the number of students in Forsyth County Schools who take the high school physical science course versus the eighth grade physical science. Um, our science course, which is physical science at eighth grade. And so that's only a 32 student difference. 
And that's why our numbers, I've got that statement, that we can't make that direct comparison to the state average because uh, in many other systems, students take the eighth grade science course unless they are predicted to do extremely well on the high school physical science. So we give all of our students in Forsyth, all of our eighth grade students, opportunity to take that course. And this is the combination of six through eight. So once again, how are we performing uh, across middle school, our students, compared to the state average? Then within, of course, these aren't grade level specific. There are typical grade levels where students take these courses, but these are only listed by the subject area. So these are the four end of course tests. And uh, like you saw with end of grade, our students are performing consistently higher than students around the state on the same subject areas. So this slide is a comparison to pre-pandemic levels, and the state strongly discourages to make longitudinal comparisons to pre-pandemic levels because we know that there was uh, an effect that, that uh, impacted learning. But we still think it's important to look at that data. Right? We want to know where were we before the pandemic, how were our students performing. So this gives you a view at each level of how our students performed in, back in 2019 and then how they performed in 22. Yes, I would, I would agree with that. And, you know, we do see it when you're looking at those individual grade levels and subjects, you do see some of that where we can say, well, at, at what level when students are learning to read or making that transition to reading to learn, um, you can see some of that. But when you look at the aggregate results, it definitely had an impact across all subjects. When you saw these, what did you think personally from your professional opinion looking at it? What, what did you think? The comparison to 2019. Yeah, do you think it would be a lot more? Do you think it would have been? Um, I had expected to see, I, I knew that we would see a difference. And my counterparts, when I meet with my counterparts throughout the, uh, the metro area and the state, it's one of those things where we expected to see a difference. But um, I have a bullet on the next slide that, that essentially says that you can see that even with the challenges that our students faced in Forsyth, um, they are still performing well. Um, you know, when you consider the learning loss that took place. So it, it's expected, but at the same time, we see that improvement taking place to recover. I think there's a couple of assumptions, educated assumptions you can make when you look at this. Number one, the fact that we gave parents a choice beginning in the fall of 2020, <clears throat> and we had the majority of our students came back for face-to-face, -face, although we had a large number learning virtually. Some of our students were very successful in the virtual environment, but I think one assumption you can make in general terms, students are going to perform much better face-to-face -face than they are virtually. There are certainly outliers. We have kids who have been involved with Forsyth Virtual Academy for years, and they do very, very well. They, they know how to work independently. Uh, parents are appropriately engaged. They have the support and resources they need to be successful. But we certainly had kids in our community that while they may have been online and may have been submitting, submitting work, there's no question their learning suffered as a result of learning virtually. Uh, but to what Tim just said is very true. As I talk to colleagues around the state, although we certainly see a difference between pre-pandemic and now, if you looked at these slides in other school systems throughout Georgia, you would see much bigger gaps when schools were out for far longer periods of time. So that's a couple of things I think you can certainly, you know, make exceptions or, or, or make inferences based on the data we have. I started looking at it too and thinking about my take on this, mm -hmm. you know, and learning is learning. Yeah. We learned different yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah. But then I ask, why did we learn different? What still always ask why? You know, so I plant that seed today of saying, mm -hmm. why was it different? Why was it not as sufficient as face to face? See if those are voids that we can strengthen. And you know, one of mine is 
ever since we came with the sta- Georgia Performance Standards, turn those into home things we can learn at home as well, engage that parent, teach them in the home community so that they can learn all the time. Like we learn as we become adults, we become lifetime learners, but we learn with stuff all around us and learn from what we, we learned here. <laughs> well, the one so thing you, you learn is, you know, student engagement for one, yeah. you know, I hope we never repeat oh, absolutely. You know, having to be, learn virtually everybody again. But if we did, we would be much better. better. Yeah. because we learned a lot from that experience. And our teachers who are teaching virtually now, uh, by choice, who yeah. want to teach virtually, are, are performing at a much higher level, too, based on what they've learned from that experience. I mean, yeah, I there, there's no question. we can learn something from Absolutely. it and then increase yeah. how we do it today, even though it's back face-to-face. Use that learning yeah. today. But the guiding question is, how do you engage students in a virtual environment? Yeah. And I think our teachers learned a lot about how to do that. Yeah. I, I was at a local school council yesterday, one of our high schools in the South End, and during the peak of the pandemic, they had about 50% of their students were yeah. hybrid or virtual, and now they have 98% face-to-face. And that, to me, speaks volumes about the, the level of quality of our teachers, that those students realize, and that's a gamut of students, that's high flyers, that's a whole mix of students, that they realize the value of our teachers being in person, and that they get that extra of being in front of the teacher, and no matter how what, what their level of, of learning is, they, they really being in the classroom. And I think it's not just the teacher, I think it's being in the school, I think it's being around their students, it's a social atmosphere, it's, it's more than the, the, the being in the classroom, I think it's the whole package that comes with being in the school. So I really do think it's everything that we have to offer in the schools as well. And when it comes back to the comparison, I know that this is a large picture, right? You have it at each grade level. Do you have that also, the data of the comparison? I mean, not to share here, but I would, you know, like I had a first grader during it, and I see, you know, with that, and since then there have been plans put in place, you know, after school help, EIPs, like that kind of stuff. So I love the extra support. That are, that are there, um, but I would be interested just to see the difference at, you know, those pivotal learning kind of markers um, in, a, in an elementary school if there's such a discrepancy or if there's a greater discrepancy or all, not. All of our schools, as you know, have school improvement plans, right. and, and part of that is they look at their data and, and they set goals based on what their data shows them, yeah. Got it, okay. So one last question. The, the Prior screens were focusing on the proficient, where you were in the 60s, 70s range. For your meets and exceeds and your lower level of gaps, how did that go as far as comparison to pre-pandemic? And they, they are consistent. Consistent, so, uh, same. My initial analysis that I did for this presentation had all of you know, the historically what you saw, which was the uh, developing and above, proficient yeah. and above, and then distinguished by itself. Uh, and this at the individual grade levels and the state comparison as well to pre-pandemic. Um, but a- as we focused on what we felt was most critical, um, we removed a lot of those charts. But it was it is consistent. So our, our distinguished is consistent um, with like when you make when you look at that comparison to uh, pre-pandemic. And so the two summary statements here, um, Forsyth had the highest, uh, you know, what I do is I look at systems throughout the state, I analyze it twice, once every system in the state by subject area, and then again by systems who test over 1,000 students per test. And so when I say large systems in here, we're talking about systems that that are testing over 1,000 students. And in the majority of EOG and EOC subjects and grade levels, uh, we had the highest scores in the state for large systems often even when you include all systems. Um, And that second statement, I spoke to that a few minutes ago, that, you know, we're not where we were before the pandemic, but even when you account for that learning loss, our students are still performing very well. I just want to say thank you for including your data because I know that over the last couple of years when you're working with the state, even the state now saying, hey, don't use pre-pandemic numbers, 
there's always they're always moving the goalposts or always changing the state standards so you can never come up with a consistent pattern of what things look like and how to how to grow and how to, to improve things because they're like oh well don't don't look at that one don't look at this one and they're doing that again with this and so i just applaud you for doing our own data looking at it and creating our own data for our community so thank you for that i know it's a lot of work on your part but thank you for that Well, I have. I can send you. I can look at that and send it to you. Um, when I'm looking at it, I don't look at the overall number of students in the system. I look at the number of students who took the test. So, if a thousand students or more took the biology test, then I consider those to be large, <coughs> large systems. Our large systems meetings. There are typically 22 to 25 systems represented. And I don't know if it's the same number, but I would say roughly that would be. It'd be around 20. And that's from all of the yeah, states, yeah, like right, Savannah. yeah. Is there any way to see how Forsyth compares nationally, or there's just not a way to even do that? Not with the milestone yeah. assessment. Okay. So um, we do that with national assessments. So okay. uh, one of the reports that I do for um, each of the high schools is to take their AP test. Oh, the high school does. Okay, but not on another level. Yeah, oh, that's correct. Okay, okay so um, now to address like how we are um, dealing with some of that learning loss, I'll turn it over to Amy Chang. Good afternoon. Um, as I'm sure you remember, we received about $13 million from the um, ESSER three grant, which was part of that American Rescue Plan, the ARP. And um, as a requirement of that grant, we were to set aside 20% of the grant, um, which is approximately $2.6 million to address learning loss. In order to determine how we were going to spend those funds, we had to have an initial consultation meeting with our community members. So we held that in May of 2021. And um, through that consultation and through continuous consultation that does occur every six months, um, we actually determined that we wanted to invest in uh, additional learning opportunities, which meant extended learning opportunities for our students, um, which we ended up doing summer school. So um, we... Uh, uh, gave our um, elementary and middle school students um, opportunities to um, extend their learning in both reading and mathematics. We determined the invitation for those students using a multiple criteria that um, really targeted those at-risk students that were um, really lacking in skills and in standards in both of those areas. In the high school, we offered credit recovery opportunities. So the students that actually failed coursework in literature, mathematics, science, and social studies were offered that opportunity to come this summer and recover those credits. We did offer door-to-door -door transportation, and we also used some um, actually school system funds in order to provide some meals for the students as well, especially those high school students that were going to be staying all day to recover both the math and um, the literature, the science, or the social studies. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to my colleagues for them to tell you about the results of summer school. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to share that we had the opportunity to provide summer school to our elementary learners. Because as we've all known, the pandemic has had an impact on learning. And when we talk about testing, as Tim mentioned, milestones cover grades three and up. But we also, as Amy mentioned, had to look at multiple criteria for our most at-risk learners that are experiencing deficits in both reading and math to be served in other ways so that we could fill in those gaps. So I'm excited to share that we served 474 elementary students in this year's summer school program at five different school sites. And not only was this a great opportunity for our students, but also going back to our leader profile and developing leaders, we were able to put aspiring leaders in charge of these programs at five sites so they could de develop their competencies to hire staff, get a whole school up and running for a month, um, develop the instruction, and it. it was just a great leadership opportunity as well. Um, with those 474 students, our goal was to engage them in highly engaging learning activities. And you can see from the pictures here, they had an extraordinary time. Um, in math in particular, we have two data points to look at. The first one you see on the left is our Big 10 and Big 20. That measures fact fluency, basic fact fluency. So our scores initially were just a 30%, 37% proficiency. 
And by the end and of summer school, it was 50%. And again, these are our most at-risk learners across our district. And then down below on the right, you can see we use the Math for Love program. And I just want to highlight this. Brian Lack, uh, Dr. Brian Lack, our math specialist at elementary, really researched what are the best programs for these deficit areas. And this was a program specifically designed for the short term of summer school. We served these students for 19 days, but it was all hands-on, manipulative-based, and the students were able to learn games and hands-on learning that they could also take home and continue to use beyond the summer school experience. You can see there the, the results were great. This refers to more application of mathematical concepts, which we demonstrated 26% of mastery initially and grew to 47% in mathematics. Yes, in 19 days. days. I mean, it's really <laughs> yeah. extraordinary. Brian's a mathematician and was like, 80% growth, Amy. This is really tremendous. And it really is for 19 days. And it, I just love these pictures because if you walked into those classrooms, this is what you saw. Kids deeply engaged in learning those mathematical concepts. So we're really proud of the results. I think you wonder if there's something that you just take and apply to that just a regular everyday classroom learning. Listen, those teachers were just grasping for all of the things that they learned through that program to take back into their, their classrooms this school year. So it was a win-win for all of us, absolutely. And even more exciting, if it could be more exciting, is our, our reading program in summer school. And you see the measures here. We um, took our ERLA, which is the independent reading assessment from ARC that we use, and paired it to what we would expect to see in a 19-day for gains. And 64% of our students either met or exceeded that growth goal. Again, for 19 days was extraordinary. But more importantly, I want to highlight what we did this summer with summer school. Our ELA content specialist, Dr. Courtney Bean, paralleled literacy summer institutes in reading for our teachers. And those institutes were held at four of our summer school sites. So cohorts of teachers were learning about the teaching of reading and then had the opportunity to go into our summer school classrooms and apply that deep level of learning directly with students. And those are the pictures you see here. So we're learning how do we identify these specific deficit areas and then target specific teaching strategies and interventions to use with students as a learning lab, if you will. So we had our teachers learning alongside and then applying the learning directly with our students. So we really believe from our department in promoting job embedded professional learning. And this was a wonderful example. Again, a win-win. We're developing our teachers for working with all students, but our summer school students got the benefit of really individualized teaching practices and learning practices specific to their skill deficits. So it was a great, we had some just amazing feedback from our teachers about the, this learning experience, and you can see there our students benefited as well. So it was a highly successful elementary summer program. We're grateful for the CARES money. Um, our teachers really just begged and said, can we do summer school again? Because these students really enjoyed their time with us for those 19 days. Yeah, what, what, is there a plan to continue summer school or? That was from our, we were able to provide to so many and the five sites and so many because of the CARES money right. that Amy alluded to. This was how we decided to really target learning loss. So in terms of the future for that, um, I can so I'll let we'll, Amy come to speak we'll to that. We'll have another consultation meeting with our community and stakeholders in October. Um, and so, yes, we do have funds still available in the learning loss set aside that we can put to that, but we will um, reach out for input from our stakeholders as well. So we're hoping that that is what we continue to do. But again, we will make those decisions with them as well. And I just want to, before I turn it over to my colleague Heather, say, reiterate what Amy said about the transportation piece was absolutely critical. We were able to provide transportation to and from summer school, and Michael Satterfield and his department did an exemplary job of scheduling think about 474 students door-to-door -door service, and he had that running like a well-oiled machine. So we, we really do appreciate our transportation department as well. Good afternoon. I would just like to say that through the ESSER funding, allowing and making provisions for summer school for K-12 really has been a tremendous um, thing that we were able to do. As far as middle school, this was also, well, the second year that we've been able to provide middle school. And 
With the math and reading, we, again, chose the most at-risk students across our middle schools. And we brought all of the middle school students together at Otwell Middle School. In fact, this year, we had all secondary summer school in one location. It really made things a whole lot easier on the transportation piece. And having all the kids in a very compact environment also worked well for any other things that could have happened in summer school that this year luckily did not. So with summer school for math and reading, you can take a look. Our math students, students participated in one or the other. They either did math or they did reading. And as far as math is concerned, Kathleen Carpenter, our content specialist for math, took the lead with the math to create district pre-assessments and post-assessments and then the curriculum that was used during summer school. And what they did is they took those standards that provided the most challenge to our most at-risk students and really focused on those standards and then also took a look at the standards that were upcoming. So if you were in sixth grade, they brought in the seventh grade standards that might be particularly challenging to a struggling math student and spent time with that preview of the instruction in the hopes that as the kids, they won't be seeing this for the first time. So when they took their pretest in math, they scored at a 36%, but when the students took the post-test, we had a 71% pass rate. So there was a, a tremendous amount of growth in that area. As far as reading is concerned, for the students that focused on reading in summer school in grades six through eight, we used Reading Plus, which is a federally funded reading intervention program for our most at-risk reading students. And our students there did very well, 77% of the students focusing on reading either met or exceeded their goals in Reading Plus. So we felt really positive about the impact that middle school, summer school had on our middle school kids. And for them, you know, those are students that they don't have to have a babysitter at home in the summer, so they could stay at home. So for those students that came, really benefited. How many students were in the middle school program? Well, unfortunately, not as many as we would have liked. We had about 80 come on a regular basis. Um, but I do think part of it's because they – they didn't have to go to summer school to have someone taking care of them. Um, but for those 80 that attended, I really feel like they benefited greatly. And again, they had that door-to-door -door service, and they had snacks and lunch. Okay, for high school, high school has always been a summer school opportunity, mainly in the area of math. Summer school for high school students is credit recovery only, and it is important because... Summer school enables our high school students who have gotten off track to get back on track in order to meet graduation requirements and to get them graduated on time. Because when our high school students start high school, it starts their high school cohort and they have to finish in four years. So the summer school opportunity with math in the morning and then science, social studies or English in the afternoon has, was very beneficial. They too met at Otwell Middle School, and we've been very fortunate with our secondary high school because our, we've got some of the same teachers that have been coming to teach summer school for years now. They really love working with struggling learners. They love working at summer school, and they really work hard to build really strong relationships, which I believe in large um, part is why we have the numbers that you see in front of us right here. We did have some students who participated both in the morning and in the afternoon, but most kids did one or the other. And the following two slides show you the data by course. So for Math Academy, which was in the morning, you can see the courses that we offered and the success rate that we had. Um, of particular, I'm particularly interested in the fact that our Algebra II students Algebra 2 for high school students is very difficult. And for a struggling math student, it's one of those courses that causes a lot of angst. And all of the students that participated passed, and we were very excited about that. And then you can take a look at the English percentages at the bottom, and then our social, our social studies data as well as our science data. Really impressive. 
We were very proud. We feel like we really got a number of kids on back on track, and I feel we're going to see, you know, the fruits of that labor, you know, down the road. Okay, well, thank you, and I'm going to pass the mic along to Susan Norse. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about our Beak Informative Assessment. So Beak Informative Assessment is really the tool that allows us to continue individualizing instruction for students and providing supports throughout the school year. I think we did talk a little bit about it last year and the year before. This is the third year we've had Beacon. In the past two years, we've given the Beacon Assessment um, throughout the schools more like an interim, more like um, you know once or twice a year and then looking at the data. It's a phenomenal tool. It's adaptive. It's for um, third grade through eighth grade, English language arts, and math. And when I say it's adaptive, what I mean is if a fifth grade student takes the math assessment, they start out getting fifth grade math questions. But depending on how they respond, they may get sixth grade math questions, they may get seventh grade math 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 questions, they may get fourth grade, and they may get third grade as well. So it really allows us to provide off grade level above and below data. Um, it's really designed as a tool for a teacher. Sometimes when school test coordinators want to find reports and they are very frustrated and they call me, I said, it's not designed for us at the district level. It's not designed for us at the administration at the school level. It's designed for teachers to use the data. It can be given in a variety of ways. It comes as a full battery where you can give a full ELA test or a full math test, or you can just give one part, maybe an algebra assessment or maybe a geometry assessment. And there, in the second half of the year, there's a milestones predictor report. So it'll say, if a student took the milestones test this day, this time, this would be the scale score that they would get. So it's a really powerful tool. If you look at, I wanted to share this with you because this shows you the performance levels and the performance bands. And it's really important to understand that if a student's in a certain color, that they could be two grade levels below in a certain area or in a certain domain. And then when we go look at students in bands, if you look at band one, students had said they need support in the current grade and two grade levels below, which we are seeing a lot of students in band one based on the last two and a half years of, of education that we've had. Or on the opposite end, you could have students in band seven, band eight, and band nine who are prepared for the current grade and one or two grades above. So um, I spend a lot of time going out to schools, meeting with teachers, and tech, talking about the results. And I really take some time to make sure they understand what the report means. Um, this year, Beacon has kind of taken on a life of its own. Towards the end, the second half of last year, schools were calling me and saying, hey, could we do this with Beacon? And I'd say, sure. There's no particular way you have to use the Beacon tests. So I say, sure, try it, or sure, do this. And then this year, we're really giving all the schools the opportunity to make Beacon fit their school and what they need. So the administrators talked to the teachers. They said, what do you want? How do you want to use this? And it really, again, ultimately, at the basis of it all, it's designed to identify learning gaps and enrichment. Um, so um, one of the schools, Piney Grove, um, Tamika and I talked as soon as Tamika became principal. And you know, I know Tamika from working at, at you know, teaching and learning. And I knew she would love this. And at high school, she wasn't exposed to it. So we said, let's work on how we're going to use Beacon at Piney Grove. So what they are doing is they looked at what they're teaching in September, right? And then they picked some test lists, just parts of the main test. And we gave those test lists to the students and then looked at the data before they ever started instruction. And then we kind of ranked students what students need support, what students are on level, and what students need enrichment. And then they're designing their whole instruction in the month of September based on this data. And then we're going to come back, excuse me, then we're going to come back and revisit and say, how did it work? And then move forward from there. Um, some elementary schools um, are implementing MTSS time, where they're working with students who, not necessarily for on-grade level, but off-grade level support. And a lot of the elementary schools are using the Beacon data for this MTSS time. John Strang and I worked with Big Creek Elementary School, and we showed them their data. And then the teachers identified the low and high areas that they needed to support. Then the teachers decided which domains, for example, craft and structure, or algebra, or um, you know writing, and which teacher was going to work with what, and they're sharing students across a grade level during MTSS time based on what they wanted to teach. So it's a very exciting time for Beacon. As you can tell, I really care very much about it. And, um, and I just look forward to the future with, and I think it holds a lot of potential to meet our students where they're at. Thank you. 
So as Dr. Bearden referenced earlier, each of our schools is taking their data. They're looking over um, not just their milestones data, but any data they have and are creating school improvement plans. Mr. Young and I spent the month of August. We took um, Heather Gordy and Amy Bartlett with us. Sarah Taylor also joined us at these meetings where we sat down with each principal and their admin team and looked at the data, looked at the goals, and how can we align district support to help those schools meet their goals. So this is an example that you see on your screen where our school improvement plans are tied directly to the strategic plan. And while the strategic plan has, I believe, 14 different performance objectives, what we asked our principals to do was to focus on the same four. And so each of our school's school improvement plans, they have a goal for social emotional health that they're sharing with us. They have a goal related to culture and climate. And they have two goals related to the learner experience. So underneath the learner experience, they're talking about what are they doing to help increase student achievement and also what are they doing to help increase student growth. And so a great example is what Susan just shared with you. Some of the schools, as they're looking at ways that they can focus on student growth, they're bringing Susan or John Strang or other people in to use those assessment tools and to help gauge where students are and not just how to teach the standards, but how to teach students where they are in relation to the standards. So how to personalize and individualize that instruction so that every child grows from where they're coming in to where they need to be. We feel very strongly that um, we want to align and be very intentional and coherent, starting with our strategic plan, ultimately starting with our learner profile, with our end in mind, but taking our strategic plan and those major goal areas and dropping that down into the school improvement plans so that we're looking at each individual school community and what they need. I hope you've heard from our team today how we, we don't just take our milestone scores and we're done and we celebrate and we move on. We're looking deeply at the data that this provides and we're looking at our next steps very intentionally and how we're supporting all of our students, whether they're struggling or excelling, and how we're supporting our teachers to make sure that they have what they need to meet our students' needs. Amazing. I mean, awesome. it's just an excellent presentation. and. Uh, the data is uh, amazing that you guys use it and, and I've already talked about, you know, looking outside the box and using your own data and not counting on the state and, and following the state guidelines to a certain extent when they're saying with the data. So thank you for that. I think the way you talked about it, you break it down by using all the data and Dr. Bearden keeps talking about engagement. When you're talking about meeting the students wherever they are and by using the data, you're doing that, whether they're high achievers or wherever they're at, you're going to engage them and that's going to be important. So I think that's, you're showing that. So the school improvement plans are going to do that. I'm excited to see how the year goes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is policy IKBC, the material harmful to minors complaint resolution process with Ms. Mr. Mike Evans. I don't think I can top the Educational Foundation yeah. and all the amazing work that our TNL department <laughs> is doing with a, with a new policy, but I will do my very, very best for you guys. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be showing, showing and presenting today is uh, a new board policy, and this was based off of Senate Bill 226 that was passed this, um, um, this past year in legislation. Uh, this is the uh, official document that we'll be submitting. Um, I'll just kind of scroll through here, but I have a presentation that will be breaking apart each section of it as well. Uh, with me today as well, I've got Jason Ale, who is our Director of Instructional Technology and Media, as well as Lisa Newberry, who is our District Media Specialist. So um, I'll invite them to come up as well. Uh, as I go through this so that if, if there are questions when we finish up, they've been involved in this whole process along the way as well. Um, so here's the official uh, policy that is going to be proposed. And let me go ahead and jump into our slide deck. And just to confirm, this is a new policy. This is a new policy. That is correct. That is correct. So this is uh, board policy IKBC. Um, and this policy was based off of Senate Bill 226. And um, part of that legislation stated that um, the uh, Georgia Department of Education would, would create a draft policy for school districts to implement, and this is revolving around uh, material that is harmful, uh, considered harmful to minors, and we'll jump into that here shortly. So our board attorney is actually also the um, Georgia School Board Association attorney, um, so he pr um, provided a draft policy with us. Uh, we reviewed it internally within our team as well as members of the teaching and learning staff. 
Uh, we also met with our attorney for clarifications in the language on that. And then what we're doing today is presenting it to you and where it will sit 30 days for public uh, input. And then at the October board meeting, we'll vote on that as well, taking into account uh, any uh, feedback along the way. The intent of this legislation, this is really to address complaints submitted by parents or permit guardians alleging that material is harmful to, that is harmful to minors um, has been provided or is currently available to his or her child who's enrolled in the school system. Um, so this is a very specific uh, focus of, um, of policy and one that we're going to jump into a little bit further because this is different than a book challenge and I'm going to break out the differences between the two here. So by the law, in our board policy, if you look at the legislation in our board policy that was provided, uh, it, they, it, they mirror almost hand in hand. Uh, they're almost identical and our attorney mentioned that he wanted to make sure that we were uh, adhering to the policy or the law uh, language as much as possible. So this focus is uh, on um, content that focuses around nudity, sexual content, sexual excitement, or sadomasochistic abuse. And the key thing here is that these three areas down below, these are the, the three key areas that um, all three of them would need to apply for uh, material to qualify underneath this. Uh, the first one, obviously, uh, taken as a whole, predominantly appeals to the prurient, shameful, or morbid interests of minors. Two, patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community um, with respect to what's suitable material for minors. And then third, Again, when taken as a whole, lacks in serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. Uh, two key points to point out there is that taken as a whole uh, is mentioned twice in that. And then the and underneath the second bullet is that all three of these would need to apply for something to be considered harmful to minors. It is, a, it is a high threshold. I agree with you there. So what I want to do is show the, the difference between what our current uh, policy is and what this new policy would entail. And um, th the first thing is that on the left-hand side, any challenge with a media, or if someone was challenging a media center um, book, and we had these this past year as well, uh, that would initiate with the school principal. And it, and it might be on any matter of content that someone might have disagreed with or felt that was inappropriate for a school. Um, the, uh, the other uh, stipulation there is that the appeal previously would be from a parent or guardian or any other Forsyth County resident. Then they would have 45 days to review uh, that and, and respond back. Um, the new policy focusing specifically on the, the harmful to materials content that we just discussed would fall underneath this category. An appeal for harmful to minors would go to a principal. Uh, the principal, or um, in this as well, the new policy is that it can only be uh, appealed by a parent or guardian of a child at that school. So whereas previously it was open to any Forsyth County resident um, at any school, this focuses it in on the specific school that the child may attend. Uh, and a big significant change as well, right now it uh, it is at seven days to review. So the principal or designee has seven days to review and then three more days to repl reply to the parent or guardian. That's a significant change from the time that we had before. Um, and at that point, uh, if the complainant disagrees with the decision, then we're, gonna, we're asking that there'll be a 20 days to appeal to the Board of Education. So that's where the legislation changes significantly. Previously on the left-hand side, the current policy is that an appeal or um, a disagreement with the school decision would then come to the district media committee. 45 days would kick in and then they would respond back and then they would have additional days to appeal to the Board of Education. The new policy that is specific harmful to minors uh, removes the district media center or committee appeal. It goes right from the school to the Board of Education as well. Um, the Board of Education would have 30 days to respond. Uh, during that time, the, the complaint may also um, uh, uh, share during uh, uh, public participation during a Board of Education meeting as well. The, um, on the left-hand side, one of the changes also that we're doing is that we discussed this this past year when we were looking at making changes to the policy. Um, is that we are going to be reviewing and reducing the 45 days down to 30 days because the current policy that as it stands will still be in, into effect. Um, someone may appeal or, or challenge material or content that is uh, outside of the, the sexual nature, the harmful materials nature. So that would still follow that similar policy along the way. Um, another note to, to point out is that 
Um, the new harmful to minor policy is not just specific to media center books. Um, the law states and the policy also states is that, uh, that students are exposed to um, material that is harmful to minors at the school. So it might be something that is in a classroom. It might be a, a curriculum aspect. It might be a digital resource. It might be a book in the media center. So that does open it up a little bit further for the type of content that would fall underneath the, um, the harmful to minors um, section. Um, if the Board of Education um, uh, agrees with the school that the content is not harmful to minors, then the law states as well, we have to list it on the Board of Education website within 15 days, and it must be published there for no less than 12 months also. Um, all other challenges that, that take place will go through the, the same process, so if it's outside of that realm for harmful to minors. Uh, additional items, again, we've had this dialogue for you know, many, many months now. Um, and we've met with a variety of parents and, and groups to try to figure out ways that we can um, really help involve the parents in the reading aspect to their children. So one of the things that came from the conversations last year is that we did implement this year uh, an email notifications for parents to sign up for so that they can receive an email every day um, that lists the books that their children have checked out. We encourage that because then if a parent does have concerns, when they get that email, they can look it up, do some self-investigation uh, to make sure that, that that book might actually align with their family values or the family morals and that, with the concerns that might come. Mike, real quick on that. Where did that come from? Because we were, I think it was several months ago, the company, they weren't yeah. going to do it. Okay, and then right. Get, so did you Good guys point. Yourself? So, so Destiny was, they were looking at doing that, a way to do that uh, holistically as part of it. Um, and once they, they kind of change course, and we know that they change course on a couple things that they're going to be doing, and we work with them to find out a way that we can implement that along with Infinite Campus, our student information system. So what we did was uh, when parents fill out that survey that, that says, yes, they would like to receive book notifications, uh, that goes into a section in Infinite Campus, um, the, a consent section where they, they say yes to, you know, other variety of other um, items from public participation surveys and things like that. Um, and then we import that nightly into Destiny. So what we're doing is we're actually using Destiny's overdue book notification system to send these emails to parents. So kind of tweaking the system a little bit. You were very intuitive with it. So yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Jason and Lisa, they, they did a great job working with, um, with Destiny and our folks at Infinite Campus to make sure that we could actually find a way to really involve the parents and give, um, give them some responsibility that they're really looking for as well for that involvement. Um, so the current numbers as of yesterday when I pulled the numbers and uh, put this together, we actually had um, over 4,200 that already submitted the request to receive the emails each day. Uh, and that's the breakdown right there uh, based on the level. So even you know, if we were thinking maybe more so at the elementary school level, there's still a significant level in the secondary um, also. Well, um, I think, and not to, but to piggyback on what Wes is saying, you know, we have had conversations about like, you know, and this is just a great example of how Forsyth, how it's like, you're going to get it done. You know, you're going it's you're yeah. you're either getting better or you're getting worse and you're always, you know, at the choice. Yeah. They want to they can if they don't they don't. Always looking for ways to just improve. So and that's I one of the things that, that we know that we're never going to uh, make everyone happy. Right. The decisions that we make, um, there will always be some folks that wish it could be a little bit more. Um, and at least with this process, this allows the parents to at, to have not immediate access, but the emails do come out at 4:30 every single day. Um, so that, uh, that they'll get that if their child checked out a book that day at 4.30, they'll get a notification. So at least that'll help with some type of notification uh, that will involve the parent too. Mm -hmm. um, again, I mentioned before, we are changing the appeal time for the other uh, challenge aspects to 30 days. Um, we've also um, increased the, uh, the committee members at the school level as well as the district media committee. Um, we, we doubled those from one parent per school to two parents, and um, the district media committee increased that to four parents as well so that we could try to increase the parental involvement. Um, and then over the next uh, 30 days, while this um, policy is sitting out for public uh, input, um, we'll be updating the regulations and the, the procedures that would come in line with uh, the new policy that comes as well. Questions for myself or my amazing team that I'm here with? Great question. So we, we've had, a, that's one of the questions that we had dialogue with our attorney on that. Um, so no, the law does not stipulate that. So if, if a challenge is made at a school and the, the, the school decides that, uh, that they 
agree with the parent that it might be considered harmful to minors. They, they decide to remove it. It's, uh, it would still be available in other schools. Um, if a, an appeal is done to the Board of Education level and um, say the school decides to keep a material and the board decides to remove it, it will be removing it just at that school. And we had hmm. some, some conversation with our attorney about that because the, the language of the law states that it's a, a community. Um, and what is a decision at the North community might be different than the decision at a Lambert community or Denmark or West community as well. So the decision is actually going to be applying specifically to the school that it was submit, submitted. Now, I've got to tell you, though, when, when book challenges or material challenges come through, um, there'll be an awareness. You know, everyone, our administrators, our media specialists, will be aware that there's a challenge going on. Obviously, they can take a look at the materials that they have in their books as well. Um, but it will be specific to that school that was submitted. Now, that was a very good legal answer, as Mike has been learning to do <laughs> over the last couple of months. The practical matter is, if a book is found to be harmful to minors at a specific school, I would hypothesize that if it's challenged at a neighboring school, it's just going to be an expedited process. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the same thing happen. Because to your point, it's pretty hard for us as a governance team representing all of Forsyth County to say, this book should be removed from high school A, but it's going to stay in high school B. But the law is the law, and we have to follow it. But from a practical matter, I think it certainly sets in motion what would happen at, a, at another school if it gets challenged. Um, and I have a question about the current... C c so there's a book review policy, and then there's this harmful to minors policy, which encompasses other things besides the books, right? Correct. But it also includes the books or no like if if I had a book challenge and then you know I'm, I'm doing this could technically the principal could just be the authority to say the book stays or the book goes correct the, the law actually states the principal or designee now the recommendations is that the, the principals are involving members of their of their, their team media exactly. Committee. You know we've uh, because in both items uh, or all three of the items that are listed, two of them mention as a whole, looking at the the material or the book as a whole, um, and you know there's a there's there's a likelihood the the principal may have read the material or, or read the book. Um, but the recommendation is that they're going to involve members of their team, their media specialists, maybe their language arts uh, teachers that might be involved or have knowledge about the book, or the media committee if there's time that's involved in that too. Um, so I, I, I don't see a situation where it would just be a, a school administrator making that decision. I'm just wondering, legal, I mean, legality-wise, could a well, principal... challenge it. If the principal says, we're keeping it, then there's the next challenge. Or if the and principal the says, no, I just... This, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but this is not going to set our principles up for lawsuits or... No, no. Okay. It's, it's just like out of districts or whatever. You, they have the, the... They can go further if they don't agree with what the principles... That's exactly it. Yeah. That's where the appeal to the board would come into place. Right. So if we talked about the appeal process at our level and what that looks like and where that happens... We're going to be defining that. Um, over the next 30 days, we're going to be working with our attorney on that as well um, because there's, there's still some vagueness that comes along with that one. We wanted to make sure that we got this out there for 30 days and, um, so that we could begin the process. We did want to make sure that we implemented it so that we didn't have to wait until the, July, or the January 1st um, uh, deadline. Um, so we, that's why we wanted to go ahead and move this part out. But over the next 30 days, we'll be, we'll be working with um, our attorney on what that process would look like at the board. Started my wheels turning when it says we got 30 days. Oh, yes, exactly. Well, it needs to be consistent, too. Yeah. 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 Agreed, agreed. All right. That's That's it. Work. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is school finance update with Dr. Jeff Beard. Okay, thank you. I um, just want to go over a, a couple of items. 
I, I stated at the August work session uh, that we were going to start meeting with our legislative delegation to discuss the future of school finances. Uh, some of our governance team members actually had a meeting this morning with several mem members of our delegation, which was incredibly positive. But I just want to make a couple of statements. A couple of things as a school system governance team, we have no control over. You know, inflation for one. You know, we're, we, we're not in in control over inflation. We're not in control over federal policies that could negatively impact our funding. We don't control the supply and demand of homes in Forsyth County. And as we all know, many families move here because of the quality of the school system. In fact, this is my ninth year serving as your superintendent. When I arrived in September of 2014, we were right at 40,000 kids. And as we stand today, we're right at 54,000 kids. So. 14,000 kids in, in, in eight years is how much we've grown, and we continue to register kids every single day. We've talked about this numerous times, but I continue to put it out there because I think it's critically important. Uh, we talked about CARES Act funding earlier today. Uh, systems around us received more than $100 million, wow. and, and, and $400 million. And some of, and many of them use the, those funds to uh, pay their employees more, offer uh, bonuses and all these types of things. We don't have any control over that. But there are things we can control and things that we are in control of, I'm really proud of. One is, and we've mentioned this many times, Larry's mentioned it, you know, every year that financial efficiency uh, as metric has been used, we've been five out of five stars every single year. Only school system in Georgia that can make that statement, five out of five stars every year or AAA bond rating by both federal agencies. We're one of, I think, 17 school systems in the entire nation to have a AAA bond rating. And that was in our control. We made that happen. We've got the lowest per pupil cost and the highest academic achievement among Georgia's 20 largest school systems. Our entire community, students, teachers, parents, we made that happen as a community. Our citizens support, value, and invest in public education. So what do our students and families receive in exchange? You know, one metric we've been using a lot lately, and I think this is important to get out there, 70% of our students who graduate from one of our high schools are eligible for the HOPE scholarship, 70%. And those scholarships save our parents lots of money, uh, thousands of dollars each year on college tuition. Last year, we had 1,500 high school students, 1,500 taking dual enrollment meaning they're earning college credit while they're in high school for free. Some of our students have actually graduated from one of our high schools with an associate's degree. That's huge. That saves our parents lots of money. We have 54 career pathways offered to our students. Most of those pathways offer industry certification and credential at the conclusion of the pathway. Many of our CTA E students graduate from high school prepared for the workforce, industry certified. Our schools offer 32 advanced placement courses. So use any metric you want. The investment we make in our students pays huge dividends, dividends for our students, our parents, and our community. And we know that having a quality public school system helps to drive economic development. So I don't think any of us on the governance team, we want to sacrifice the quality of education that our students deserve, our parents expect. We will continue to operate our schools as efficiently as possible. But tonight, what I wanted to announce, and we've talked about this a little bit on the side with board members, we are going to look to uh, ask for financial experts in Forsyth County to voluntarily join what I'm calling our Citizens Financial Advisory Committee. These citizens will be asked to meet with Larry and I several times throughout the course of the year just to review our finances, to make suggestions and recommendations. And so what I'm asking board members tonight, if you have anybody that you know in your community with a strong finance background, of course we don't want just anybody, we want someone with a background in finance that would like to serve on this committee, let Larry and I know who those people are. We're looking to try to find about seven to nine that would meet with us much like 
uh, my parent and community advisory committee several times throughout the course of the year. And again, just kind of a, a, a temperature check, you know, look at our finances, look at our revenue, look at our expenditures, any recommendations they may have. I just think it's important for our community to see that we have an, a citizen's oversight committee, if you will, in the area of finance. So if you could think about that, let us know if you have anybody in mind. Larry and I have been talking about it. We've already had a couple of names recommended to us. And then we'd look to hopefully put that committee together before the end of this calendar year. And we'll certainly report back to you after. I think that's awesome. I, I love that. I think, you know, and, and as we're growing, I think this advisor, I mean, I think that's going to be just huge, right? Um, and a um, couple questions, I guess. When when will you be meeting with that group first? So that, because I know we're looking at that at the beginning of next year. Yeah. So if we can get have, seven to nine before the end of this calendar year, I'd like to meet before the end of the calendar year, right. because at, by that time, we will have a Larry will have already started working with department heads about potential budget requests for next year, okay. and I want to start including them on, okay, here are things that are being request, requested by department heads. Obviously, in January, at some point, the board will give Larry and our, our marching orders in terms of what the board expects for our budget for the next school year. And so I, I think if we had that first meeting um, before the holidays, that would be perfect. Jeff, I just want to, I, Dr. Brown, I want to clarify. Um, we had our more official meeting today with the, like, we opened it up to the full current delegation. But, um, and we, as a board, we've met with the whole delegation in the past down at the Capitol to discuss finances. But over the last two years, we've met a number of times. Wes has Dr. Beard and myself with Senator Dolezal. We've met with Todd Jones, and we've discussed finances and, and other ways to look at things that we've done for the last couple of years. We've met a few times and done, we've done some data gathering. And so this is not a new conference. Today was not the first meeting. We've no. been doing this for a while and looking at some options that, 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 that our state representatives discussed with us. So it's not a new topic. Today we just kind of opened it up more formally to other members of the delegation to, to join in. But we're just limited by laws. The, the state delegation can meet all together, but just due to open open records laws, we can only have two of our Board of Education at any time where state members can have as many as they want. So it just limits our, the way that we're allowed to meet. So. And what was great about that meeting today and previous meetings, we're all coming to those meetings from the same place. You know, we, we want to protect the quality of the school system, yet we want to be as efficient as possible with the resources we have at our disposal. And are there other creative ways of, of making sure we have the revenue we need to take care of the needs of our kids. It was a yeah. good brainstorming session. It, was. it really was. Yeah. It was really and positive. to me, that's the, that's the key there, because we don't want to you know, do anything that's going to bind us in right. the future from being able right. to do what's best for the school system, because right. we do rely on federal funds a little bit, but on the state funds so if they choose not to right. fully fund it. So I think this is great. Thank they were you. as frustrated as we were with you know, right. federal funding and how it's been done with the CARES funding and other systems and how it's hampered us in other ways. So they were, it, was a, it was a good, positive conversation. And we also have to work with our other community groups to continue to work on our commercial side yeah. of our tax um, digest and continue to work on that. We've worked on that for so many years. It's better. Um, we've got a lot of uh, retail now involved. SPLOST has shown, started showing itself. So we know we're doing great work in retail. I think we still have a lot of work in commercial to continue to do that. We have... I mean, another ribbon cutting tomorrow, I know, and, and they're continually coming. They're slowly coming, but as the economy does what it does, that slows it down, and so we just have to work harder at that, but that's a big part of this. I think one of the things that the county's learning is that for the commercial growth, somebody's got to take the first step and make it happen, and I think that's where we're all in it together <clears throat> with the county commissioners. Um, I want to say thank you also for this financial committee because I think if you look, it's going to help me as a board member understand it maybe a little bit more and, and have some other, you know, um, learning from somebody else on some of this stuff because if you look at what we do as a board member, you know, if you look at today's agenda, we went from student assessments all the way to policies to finance. There's just so much going on, so having help by some other people in the community uh, is going to help uh, me personally as a board member, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next uh, item on the list is Policy IEDA, the Recess Unrestructured Break Time. Mr. Tim Keezer. We're doing three hours of recess. <laughs> <laughs> 
Just kidding. Oh, I thought this was for our recess. <laughs> yeah, we have to pay for it. No, you don't care. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is essentially, this is an update or uh, suggested revision to a current policy. Um, and this one's required because of House Bill 1283, which is recess for elementary school students. Um, <clears throat> the revision is based on the GSBA um, model policy with input from our principals as well. And the essential change, because we already had a policy in place, is just essentially um, changing from allowing recess to requiring recess at the elementary school level. So are there any questions? But then it says failure to fulfill classroom responsibilities or to adhere to academic requirements may result in the loss of break time. So that's really not requiring it at all, right? Because the teacher well, could say, well, nobody can have recess because you didn't do your math. <clears throat> My interpretation would be that the, that the scheduling of recess is, is what's required, and then that's on an individual basis. So the, the, the law from the state is just you have to schedule it. Yes, ma'am. But I, I think you will find, because um, this conversation has surfaced many times, that uh, schools are real, kids need to move. I mean, kids, yeah, need, kid, I kids need to be call active. Me whose kid wasn't finishing their work right. because they were couldn't sit right, still right. and they didn't get recess and they were like, but it, I feel like if he could go outside right, for 20 right, minutes, right. then he would maybe sit down and do his right, work. Right. So I just hope that we all, as you mm -hmm. say, at the schools mm -hmm. are cognizant of that and don't, Absolutely. Maybe don't use that as a pure That it might right. help rather than hurt to let them have recess. And a lot of them have built in some time during the um, academic week for students to make up work other than what is scheduled recess time for that reason to allow kids all kids to have recess well this policy will sit out there for 30 days yep. right for feedback yep. it will. Um, because i i see the statement that you're saying on that bottom sentence yep. and, yeah and so we'll see we have 30 days of feedback and, and yep. we can look at this um, but i understand what you're saying yep and i and i will say that that statement was one of the statements that did come from the model policy so um, it was already in what we recommended to our principals. Right. Thank you. Thanks. And then the last item on the list is the Forsyth County Schools government team goals for fiscal year 23. Uh, as you all have seen with today's presentation and we see every month, the staff does an excellent job aligning their tasks with the board goals. And this year's board goals, uh, we were able to align with our new strategic plan. Um, that uh, the staff and that uh, Mitch Young and, and Dr. Beard and everybody worked on. And so we made a little bit of changes, but we are very consistent and we like the way we were working with our th four goals. And so we did not change those four goals this year. Uh, we did change a little bit of the verbiage to include a little bit more of um, community involvement, um, uh, aligning some more with communication when it comes to the learner profile and strategic plan, uh, communication with effective and um, efficient financial planning, and uh, making our large schools feel small. Uh, I think that out of the four goals, obviously goal number one is our, our number one with the safety of students and staff, but goal four is what makes our schools successful, I think, and, and uh, it's something that we all are passionate about. So. Uh, these will be posted on the website so everybody can have an opportunity to look at it and see our actions. And we look forward to another great year at Forsyth County Schools. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. So that concludes our agenda. There's a motion to go into executive session for personnel and land. So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland. Second, Second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor? Thank you.